So, uh, before I start my talk uh, on ISO 1518922, my assumption is that uh, the audience is familiar with what ISO 15189 is. Am I right? I assume that everybody knows what ISO 15189. So, with that assumption is that I am going to move on. And the other question that I want to ask is, is there anyone here who has never been a patient in their lives? Anyone who has never had a chance to get their own blood or urine or any sample checked from a laboratory? Is there anyone here? Please raise hands if there is anyone who has never got a, their blood or any, any body sample checked for any purpose. So, I don't see any hands going up, so that means all of us have been patients sometime in our life. So, with that in mind, let's move on. So, what I'm going to discuss is, uh, okay, this is the newest version of the standard, uh, the 22 version which came in uh, 2022, December. So, let's, uh, what is the main focus of this new edition of the 15189 standard? And what are the challenges in the new standard? And what kind of opportunities do we find in it? And when would this standard be implemented? I would answer the last question first. Uh, now, uh, six months, more than six months have gone. So, any laboratory applying for accreditation from the Sri Lanka Accreditation Board based on this 15189 to show how your, the quality of your laboratory and the competence, now we need to apply based on this new standard. So it is applied, but there are certain laboratories who have already accredited by the earlier version, the 2012 version. They will have a grace period about three years from the publishing date transition period where you can move from the 2012 version to the 2022 version. So where are these uh, all, where is this standard coming from? I think it's good for us to be familiar with the International Organization of Standardization, which I think by this time has produced more than 24,000 uh, standards, uh, which would tell us how better we can do whatever we do in our laboratories, institutes, so they have hundreds of, uh, thousands of standards. So when you have time, you can visit their website and see what they are doing. So this is the, so if you uh, search for ISO 1518922, this is the page that you get. And you can see it has been published in 2022 in December. So, what does this standard replace? It is ISO 15189-2012 version, so which has been in practice, the third edition. So, now this is the fourth edition, right? So, apart from that, there was a separate st ISO standard for point of care testing. I assume everybody knows what point of care testing is. That is where we do bedside patient testing, for example, utilizing glucometers, right? So, that standard has now been completely withdrawn and the requirements have been incorporated into ISO 1518922. So, therefore, any hospital laboratories which would also want to check the quality of your POCT devices, either available in the ICUs or ward setting, would have to use the same, th this same standard. The other feature that we see in the new standard is, it is now more aligned with ISO IEC 17025. The current version is the 2017 version. So, the name of the standard is General Requirements for the Competence of Testing and Calibration Laboratories. So, now uh, the organization of the 15189 is more in line and similar to ISO IEC 17025. So, I think when we are trying, planning to get our lab accredited, uh, we need to also refer to this standard because there are certain lot of similarities between these two standards. So this is the page. Unfortunately, all of these standards uh, we have to pay and buy. So, um, but uh, from the Sri Lanka Accreditation Board, we are ever relevant. They make these standards available for the assessors. I'm not sure how the laboratories could acquire 
they probably will have to buy it, the relevant standards. So this is the one which has now been withdrawn, the one for point of care testing. So what is the main focus of the 2022? So it is focused on welfare of patients. So that is why I asked my first question whether we have, all of you have ever been patients. So let's look at the standard and getting our labs accredited from the point of a patient where we are all potential patients, our family members, parents, children, siblings, all of us can become parents. So if we want to get our reports accredited, uh, our reports from an accredited lab, the same applies to the general public. So let's look at it in that manner so that we can move towards getting our labs accredited. I know there are a few laboratories which are already accredited, but state sector is still lagging behind. Not a single laboratory is there which has got accredited by the earlier third division. So now as the fourth edition is here, and I know some state sector laboratories are now taking steps to go towards this goal. So, but if we think in the patient's perspective, motivated to uh, do work towards this goal. So, they believe by adhering to this standard, we can improve the satisfaction of the users. How? We are trying to increase the confidence in our reports. I mean, our users are our patients and the uh, doctors. So, we can increase their confidence in our reports if by improving the quality of our testing, there are lots of things that we can do. I mean, we are doing lots of things already in our laboratories, even if though we are not accredited. But uh, we will, can have documentary evidence to show that we are doing things all right by adhering to uh, the standard. And also, there will be a lot of emphasis on improving the competence of the personnel in the laboratory. So again, I really, again, we need to, I need to emphasize why it is important to get accredited by ISO 15189. So this guide tells us to identify risks in laboratory testing. Nowadays, we hear about a few patients here and they are dying from some adverse incidents. I mean, nothing to do with the laboratory due to some treatment aspects. So one aim, one opportunity that we see in this standard is it, is it talks so much about risk. Risk identification before something happens. So that is one emphasis of this standard compared to the earlier one. So identification of risk, which I will talk about a little later. And we need to look actively for opportunities for improvement. We cannot be complacent and just do what we have been doing all throughout the history. We always need to move forward. We cannot be stagnant in a laboratory because the laboratory sector is rapidly advancing and we need to move forward. Keeping in mind, the moving forward is to improve patient outcomes. So the expected benefits, is it only for the patients? No. By, we would reduce the number of invalid results if we adhere to the standard and also would reduce the harm not only for the patients, but also for the laboratory personnel, the public, and also the environment. So there are lots of clauses which addresses safety requirements regarding all these aspects. So in the new standard, how are the contents organized? <coughs> I need to give a little bit of introduction to the standard. So in earlier one, 2012, it was only five sections. So one, two, three are the same. The scope, the normative references, I mean, on which other uh, standards, which this one was based on, that is what is meant by normative references. And then we get the terms and definitions, uh, which is again similar, but the terms and definitions are a lot more compared to the earlier one. And then the general requirements, structural and governance requirements. In the earlier standard, there were only five sections. Now we have eight. So resource and process comes next, which are basically in the earlier standard was technical requirements. And in the earlier standard, 23rd, uh, third edition, management system requirements were clause four. Now it has been brought down. It is number eight. And this is why it is now aligned with ISO 17025. 
So management requirements are at the end, but it doesn't mean that it is not important. So the standard specifies the requirements for quality and competence in medical laboratories. So the, we can use the standard to develop our management system. No laboratory is functional without a good management system, which includes all of us. When, we, when you hear the word management system, you would think it's something the laboratory managers, the directors, the pathologists would be doing. No, there is nothing like that. It is teamwork where all of us contribute to an effective and efficient management system. Apart from that, uh, the users can check what we are doing and the regulatory authorities, for example, for the uh, state sector laboratories, the Health of Ministry of Health can check what we are doing. And then finally, we would be accredited by Sri Lanka Accreditation Board when you put in your application by uh, utilizing the standard. They would check whether we are doing things according to the standard. So a few words about definitions. There are 32 definitions which are included. So I have just selected a couple randomly here. So talk about bias. We all know what bias is, right? So if your calibrator is deteriorated, we know we will get a systematic error introduced, right? So there are so many definitions which once you get the standard, you can go through carefully. Clinical decision limit, which is totally different from the biological reference interval. In a clinical de decision limit, we will talk about a diagnostic cutoff, which can be used to diagnose or treat a patient. So there are, as I said, there are 32 definitions. So I'm, I have just selected a few. I'm not going to explain everything. I think you have already had a lecture on measurement uncertainty. So commutability. So that is where. Uh, the calibrator and the patient sample, let's say, have the same quantity, right? Uh, if when they are being analyzed in our analyzer, if they are having the same quantity, we should be getting the same signal. But if the, the calibrator does not have the same matrix, which is similar to the patient sample, you may not get that result. So that is commutability in simple terms, right? So I would advise uh, all of us to go through these definitions also carefully. We cannot ignore that. So under general requirements, there is impartiality. Impartiality is about just treating equally all patients which present to the laboratory. You cannot have any favoritism. Uh, you cannot select staff patients. You have to give equal uh, treatment to all who present to your reception desk. Confidentiality is, of course, very important because we are handling personal information about patients, so we have to maintain always the confidentiality of all the personal information that we have. So 4.3 requirements regarding patients. So as I said, the primary focus of the standard is patients' well-being, safety and rights. So that is our well-being, our safety, our rights, because we are going to be patients, right? So don't ever forget that we are patients, we are potential patients. So, and the care has to be given free from discrimination. As I said, there can be any bias toward any particular person. It has to be uh, impartial treatment for everybody. So, under clause 5 comes structural and governance requirements, legal entity. We are legally responsible as a laboratory to deliver the service. We can be uh, held responsible if something goes wrong. So laboratory director is the management authority, but he can always delegate duties uh, to other people in the laboratory. So, I mean, individual laboratories can decide. I mean, in the state sector, of course, it would be uh, decided. I mean, there are some set norms, but in the private sector, we see uh, different practices. The way are the management system, the laboratory decides, administration decides who's going to be the laboratory director. But what requires is the person who directs the laboratory should have the know-how of running a laboratory. So laboratory activities is all the testing uh, that we undertake, structure and authority, the hierarchy of remote reporting from the top management uh, to the technical officers who are doing the testing. Objectives and policies, we can't go forward without having a clear goal as to what we are going to do. So you can see now in 5.6, risk management comes. So if you read this standard carefully, I think there are about 100 places where the word risk is coming up. 
So in risk management, what they highlight is establish, implement, and maintain processes for identifying risks of harm to patients. And also look actively, proactively for opportunities for improved patient So resource requirements are quite similar to what we had in the earlier standard. So under resources, we know we have personnel, the facilities where we undertake our testing and where we collect samples, equipment, reagents, consumable, support services. There's one particular clause that have come up in the new standard which says the laboratory shall have access to a sufficient number of competent persons to perform its activities. So this is a little bit of a challenge here for us. How are we going to determine the sufficient number? How are we going to justify when the assessors come? Okay, I have five uh, technical staff in my and I'm doing thousands of tests. So how are we going to justify? So that is something the management system has to discuss about and come to a consensus. Facilities and environmental conditions again shall not adversely affect, I'm, I'm taking some clauses from the standard, shall not adversely affect the validity of results, safety of patients, visitors, laboratory users and personnel. So we need to maintain the laboratory and the premises that we operate in a safe environment, even for the visitors, the staff who are working in the lab and all the users of the lab. So it's not enough provision of safety facilities like, you know, fire alarms, fire extinguishers, I wash stations, all those have to be there, but it's not enough just having them there. We need to regularly verify their function. You cannot be having an outdated uh, fire extinguisher with the expiry date, right? So regularly we need to check. So under process requirements, so this is, I believe, is the key area for all of us. Uh, I mean, not that others are important, not important. So here again, there are eight sections, general pre-examination processes where from the page where the patient presents to the doctor. From that point where the sample comes to us is the pre-examination processes. So there are lots of things which we need to do in relation to pre-examination processes. I mean, I, we do all that, but it's required is have also documentary evidence. Examination processes, so under examination processes, the assurance of quality also comes in, which I will talk about. Post-examination processes, once you have finished your analysis, how are you going to issue your reports? Non-conforming work, wherever you see a deviation from your standard practice, right? How are we going to handle that? Control of data and information management. Now most of laboratories have moved to a laboratory information system. So therefore, uh, the control of data, how the data is transferred from the machines uh, into the reports, it may be automated. Uh, uh, still there may be laboratories who still do uh, manual transfer of uh, data. So and the validity, uh, the efficiency, the effectiveness, the validity of your information management system is considered in 7.6. It was uh, also earlier in the under the technical requirements in the earlier standard. And complaints, how we need to be looking at complaints. I mean, I always say this, they are blessing in disguise. So always look at complaints proactively, right? So complaints are where we have not thought about a possible risk, but something has happened, right? So always analyze, do a root cause analysis, and this gives us a golden opportunity to improve ourselves. So look at complaints in a proactive manner, not as a trouble. I always think complaints make, always make uh, our laboratories take from uh, just being good laboratories to better laboratories. Continu uh, continuity and emergency preparedness planning has been introduced into the standard, I think. The standard came during the COVID pandemic, so there were disruptions to the uh, continuity of operations, so this has also been now addressed. So uh, under process requirements again, you can see again risks coming up. Laboratories shall identify potential risks to patient care in the total testing process. I mean, they say pre-analytical, analytical and the post-analytical phase. What are the risks? What, are the, what is the chance of a laboratory issuing a wrong result. Let's say if we give a 
normal potassium for someone who is having a high potassium. We are issuing a wrong report. For example, there was one example pointed out today where the tubes for pediatric patients for glucose coming up in adult tubes and we are reporting a low value. So that might lead to a lot of unnecessary investigations. So there what we need to correct is actually the proper sample collection into the appropriate tube. So that is how we need to identify risks and eliminate risk. So we need to map our entire process starting from the sample collection to the issuing of reports. We need to be thinking about potential risk. The whole aim here is not going for remediation or corrective action when something happens, when incidents happen. But before something happens, before an incident takes place, we envisage it, we think about it, we try to predict. And with the prediction, if you can identify it beforehand, we can go for preventive action. So we all know that prevention is always better than cure. right? So therefore, the, here again, uh, the opportunity is there for us to identify risks beforehand and uh, mitigate the risks as much as possible. So, but at some point you will come across a situation where you cannot eliminate a risk, right? For example, we have lots of chemicals in our laboratories. So, hazard from a chemical is always a possible risk. Are we going to eliminate all the chemicals in our laboratory? We can't do that. So, we need to work with that residual risk. So, we need to uh, communicate that to our users, the staff, as well as uh, the administration. So we need to, certain risks we have to uh, do with. So we, I will talk a little about risk management later on. And I think uh, tomorrow or, the, or today afternoon, you have an entire lecture also on risk management in laboratories. Right? So, and the other thing is, as I said, to identify opportunities to improve patient care. So we need to think about Okay, what more can, I mean, let's say you detect, uh, what more can I do to increase our turnaround times? How can I improve uh, the quality of our reports? So that is how we proactively look at the opportunities. The next two couple of slides I'm going to talk about uh, how the standard refers to the internal quality control and the external quality assessment. We know that these are the two pillars of quality in laboratory examination. We can't, no laboratory can get accredited without having internal quality control and external quality assessment. And uh, with the recent economic crisis we had, I'm sure all of the laboratories went through problems of even acquiring reagents to the laboratory and how can we talk about internal quality control and external quality assessment. But remember, these two things we cannot do without. But the standard also gives us some good alternatives, right? So, so these are just uh, clauses which come up in the standard. Use of third-party IQC material should be considered. The earlier one, it may be, but here it should be considered either as an alternative to or in addition to control material supplied by the reagent instrument manufacturer. So, uh, I think one practice we have in Sri Lanka is we are always going for said quality controls, which is quite expensive, where the values have been assigned by the manufacturer. One way is why can't we go for unassayed QZ and use that uh, in our laboratories, which are less costly. And we have seen that being utilized in even developed countries. Why do we have to go for a said quality control. So that is one question you need to take back to your laboratory. So monitoring of interpretations and opinions can be achieved through regular peer review of examination results. And I think some of, labo some of your laboratories may be participating, buying quality control, where you can upload your even the internal quality control results through software and through internet uh, to a common platform. And so peer groups can be compared. So that is a good way of, another way of interpreting your results. So that has been allowed in the standard. Now in the earlier standard, there were only a few sentences about internal quality control, but now this goes for one and a half pages, right, which you need to go carefully. 
So, and the other recommendation is matrix of IQC as close as possible to that of patient samples, right? So, that is getting a commutable sample, which would mean that your QC is going to be expensive. So, IQC frequency determined by stability of the method and the risk of harm to patient with erroneous results. This is a little bit difficult. Now, even on the other side, there was a talk about internal quality control. How frequently are we going to run our QC samples and the problems which are associated with this. So a general practice I know is that you would run quality control samples in the morning and perhaps once in the night. But what happens in between, none of us know. Things can go wrong in patient samples which has not been detected by that IQC. So that problem is always there. So this is something very important. Remember that we will not release the results uh, as if our QCs have gone wrong, they have not met the required acceptability criteria, we need to investigate, treat, then only we can release results. I'm not saying it, these are all in the standard. So, and the opportunity here, the, where we can take a sigh of relief, right? So if you don't have IQC material, the laboratory can consider other methods for IQC. And now in this standard, they highlight the use of patient results, which all of us have in our database, uh, as, an, uh, as a supporting element to, uh, or as a complementary, or as, I don't know whether it can be completely used as a replacement, because now on the other side, it, this was talked about, you know, both has to be together, IQC as well as the patient results. Patient results are better in monitoring uh, on, um, on a continuous uh, basis what goes wrong in your system. So uh, concepts like moving averages can be used or you can calculate the number of results, patient results above a particular diagnostic cutoff and see whether there is a significant variation in a particular day, right? So I think, I mean, when we are working in laboratory, sometimes the technical staff comes saying, okay, today all the albumins are low, today all the sodium seems to be low or high. So they see this trend in patient samples and they know something is going wrong, right? So good laboratory uh, technical uh, staff knows this, right? So this can be utilized uh, in a um, systematic manner with supported by statistical um, using some statistical methods to uh, as an alternative for quality control. The other ones, retesting of retained patient samples, of course, is a good alternative. I'm sure this would have been utilized during this COVID pandemic when we were running out of quality control material. And then, of course, comparison of results for patient samples on a specified schedule from another procedure which has been validated to have its calibration methodological traceable to the same or higher order references. I mean, in basically, I mean, if you have two systems where you have a calibrator with methodological traceability in one system that can be utilized to check your other analyzer, whether you are getting the same results. External quality assessment, the EQA shall have the effect of checking the entire testing process. Nowadays, we concentrate, we uh, give our EQ, EQ, EQA sample and check only the what happens in the analytical phase. No, I mean, what the standard says is it should be able to check from the pre-analytical to the post-analytical. So actually it should come as a patient sample into the reception desk. And I have seen during my assessment some laboratories actually doing this, which is really good. So we need to incorporate it just like a patient sample into the system so that the entire process is being checked. And uh, this EQA sample, so you need to select an EQA provider which gives you samples which mimic uh, true patient samples. And your EQA provider should be certified with ISO IEC 17043. This is the standard, so you can check on the ISO. So this is uh, general requirements for the competency of proficiency testing providers. So when an EQA program is not available, sample exchange with other laboratories can be done, uh, which is already done for qualitative tests, I know, in most of the laboratories. And interlaboratory comparisons within IQC programs, that is what I earlier talked about. So if you are in a peer group where you are uploading your IQC results, it can be also used as an EQA alternative. 
and analysis of a different lot number of the manufacturer's calibrator. So for this lot, you use another uh, calibra calibrator from another lot from the same manufacturer. So uh, continuity and emergency preparedness planning. Okay, so we need to have a plan in case there is a disruption due to some emergency situation. How are we going to resume our operations? So we have to have a plan in the laboratory and we need to train our staff for that matter. I'm going a little too fast now as I've come to the end. My time is out. So management system requirements are aligned with ISO 9001. So if your laboratory already has got the ISO 9001 certification, you are safe because all your management requirements are covered with that. So this is the standard, 2015 is the current version. You all can check the ISO standard. So actions to address risks and opportunities. So I will briefly go through this, but there will be a separate lecture on uh, how we are going to address risks and opportunities. So types of risks, it could be for patients, users, staff, uh, staff and also there could be financial risks uh, for private sector laboratories. I mean, even this applies. Uh, for the state sector, though we believe uh, the testing that we do is free, it is nothing is free, right? So we pay. The taxpayers of this country, all of us pay for the government uh, sector services. So you need to be thinking about what are the possible points where you have to map the risks, right? So after mapping or identifying the predictable ones, the potential risks and also unknown ones, right? So we need to analyze uh, their likelihood for consequences, how bad they are and how frequent are they going to happen. And then see whether we can eliminate them or if not, how are we going to, what are the ones we can accept. So when we are determining the risk, uh, this kind of a matrix can be utilized to determine severity, right? So based on the frequency, we can give a number. And also we can give a number based on the harm to the patient. If can, it can cause the death, then of course it's a high number, number five. So the, it, you can, uh, now let's say if you have a particular risk where, which can cause uh, a risk to the patient, death, so it's five. And, but it happens once in a lifetime, so multiply it five by one, it's just five. But if it, if it is something which causes death to the patient, then of course you have to still take action to mitigate that risk, right? So anything which can cause, uh, can make a patient die, you cannot allow to be in your system. So there are different risk assessment models, which I'm not going to go into detail, but the standard does not tell you which model to use. You can use whatever the model you want. So one common system I'm sure is adopted by laboratories is failure mode and effect analysis, where we envisage, okay, if this goes wrong, I mean, if this fails, what is the outcome? So that is the basic definition of failure mode and effects analysis. Uh, so this is how we do risk mitigation, either you terminate or accept, but it's not, uh, and after, I mean, certain ones we have to accept. If there is something you have to tolerate, then of course you have to, can also transfer it to a third party like an insurance company. So you take an insurance against it. So uh, bear me for going fast to the risk analysis, but there will be a separate lecture on that. So in summary, uh, the focus, the opportunity I see is it is more patient-centered and uh, uh, use and personal welfare. And the challenge, right, without having a risk map and analyzing your risks, you will not be able to get your accreditation from the SLAB. So that is the challenge. The opportunity is uh, we, when we go for prevention, there will be less for repetition of tests and our, there will be improvement, inherent improvement of quality. And as I said, uh, standard is implemented from June 23 uh, from, uh, from the SLAB. So these were my references and I come to the end of my talk and I think I've gone out of time.